Great, and we're live. Hey, Nick. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks, and you, Bruno? I'm good. You're becoming quite um, quite efficient and actually logging onto Solna's profile and, and bringing us online. I'm getting there, but I, I will say I won't do it without, uh, I don't do it without help from uh, people in the office. It's that, uh, that one secret that you, you never want to tell your clients that in honest, in all honesty, uh, if you didn't have your, your secretaries and your PAs, nothing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So it's like gold. It's like gold. Sometimes more valuable than some of the attorneys that, that uh, work for us. hundred percent. A hundred percent. It's good to see you again. Uh, so um, everyone, Summer's busy, uh, busy today. So Nick, uh, Nick uh, is joining us and yeah, and we've got actually quite a few interesting things to chat about. Yeah. So, so what, what we thought we'd discuss now is, um, you know, for, for people sitting within the property industry, there's been a massive case that's just come out uh, within the last month. It was a case uh, from the Constitutional Court of South Africa, a very long, uh, long-legged case, you know, uh, instituted in already in 2009. Um, and, and eventually a Constitutional Court judgment after a number of appeals was, was given uh, last month. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting case. We're going to try not to bore our, uh, our listeners with uh, all, all of the legalese and, and the facts behind the case. Uh, but we thought we'd just have a discussion on what exactly the case was, what the ruling was from the Constitutional Court and the implications on the uh, landowners and property industry as a whole. So I think, Bruno, do you want to give a, just a quick breakdown of, of what exactly happened? Yeah, cool. Awesome. So, um yeah, so for the first part, maybe just uh, trying to to bring some context to the case. We're not going to go through the details, but um, our our initial panic or panic when when we had first uh, seen the high court rulings and the SCA rulings was the court kind of supporting this notion that there's um, that a tenant, certain tenants almost have an absolute right to stay on the property. Unlawful occupiers have an absolute right to stay on the property in spite of the occupation being unlawful and in spite of the landlord or owner actually having full rights of ownership. Um, and the way that they treated this was unfortunately because of the person's age and certain considerations um, so everyone needs to remember, we've got certain legislation in South Africa that governs the way that evictions are handled. And I think that is the fundamental to this conversation that everyone needs to understand as a landlord, right? Why do these exist? These exist because we live in a society where homelessness is a problem. Poverty is a problem. So this was introduced in order to support the constitution of the country when it comes to everyone's rights to housing. However, this is not an absolute right. Housing is not, it needs to be balanced with rights, for example, of ownership and being able to own land, own property. So the constitution enshrines the spirit of, you know, everyone having these rights and the legislation is about trying to find a balance between, you know, two differing rights almost and trying to find a better way of dealing with it. So the legislation came out and said, cool guys, listen, as property owners, you're entitled to evict people, but the evictions have to be subjected to certain considerations. So if a person's been there for a really long period of time, you have to consider things like their age, how many kids are there, whether it's a woman-headed household, disability, you know, a whole range of stuff. Uh, we're not even going to get into the Esther conversation. So that's another type of piece of legislation. So we have Pi and Esther. I'm not touching on Esther now because that, um, that deals with farmland, agricultural, and that sort of thing. So us in the, the residential realm, we focus predominantly with PI. So PI has these considerations. So with this case that we are now speaking about, our concern was <clears throat> that the High Court and the Supreme Court of Appeals interpretation or application of PI was concerning because this would open the door for courts to start refusing eviction orders um, being granted to proper owners where the occupants were unlawful simply because these considerations were to such a degree <clears throat> that the court felt that the order should not be granted at all. So this case was from the Constitutional Court. And in our hierarchy of courts, you've got Magistrates High Court, and then you've got your Supreme Court of Appeal. But the Constitutional Court does trump the Supreme Court of Appeal when it comes to constitutional matters. 
And this went to the Constitutional Court. It was a constitutional matter um, reflecting the rights of an owner of the property, constitutional rights, and the and interpretation of the PI. And the courts here, thankfully, for, for us as property practitioners and property owners, the courts did find that even though a land owner is expected to be patient, um, our laws aren't supposed to effectively expropriate land from an owner to the degree where a tenant can just stay indefinitely and a landowner must just, you know, kind of you know, swallow that pill. It's, uh, there needs to be a balancing right, and the courts will consider a variety of things, um, including poverty and homelessness, but they'll, uh, they will consider many, many things. In this case, it was even the provision of alternative accommodation. But at the end of the day, uh, the owner's rights do need to be considered, do need to be balanced, and the owner cannot be expected to give up everything just because. Um, and I mean, uh, uh, we all know quite, quite well, so the previous case law that speaks about um, uh, this previous case law that speaks about the owner not having to provide alternative accommodation. And I think this is where maybe we lead on to the second question that I have for you, which is, so this case did um, not, I wouldn't say prioritize, but it did give um, effect or did give a sounding board to owner rights where the previous courts did not consider it to the same degree. Um, it did speak about ownership, you know, having to be considered more. However, there is, you know, it didn't say in an absolute way that as an owner, you are absolutely entitled to an eviction order if your owner and the person's unlawful occupier, because our approach has always been, well, we're owner, we're entitled, but maybe the court will give them a longer period of time. You know, they're just an equitable would be based on time. So maybe just go into that in a bit more detail, like what is a just an, a, a justice and equity or just an equitable a, eviction order? Does that mean the order can be refused? Is it about periods of time? Uh, yeah, what's your your feelings on this case? Yeah, so I, I think what's what's uh, what's important and, and what the the constitutional court had had sort of commented on from the the other courts that had dealt with this case before it got to the constitutional court was obviously what the courts need to look for for an appropriate order for eviction in the circumstances. So um, specifically, you know, when when an eviction is being granted in 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 our uh, in our country and under our legislation, the first inquiry is always going to be. Uh, a, a, an inquiry into the unlawful occupation of the of the uh, occupants of the premises okay if the tenant isn't in unlawful occupation so they've got a right to be on the property you know say you've got a lease and the lease isn't cancelled but they've got some other they are, uh, you know rights to to the property there are small uh com more complex rights that one might have to a particular property in this case they in fact dealt with something that's called a habitatio now, I don't want our viewers to get worried about the uh, the Latin there. All it means is a life right to uh, occupy a premises. And there are there are uh, certain laws and rules that re revolve around a habitatio, how it's enforceable and when it can be enforced. But they, they touched on it. There's certain rights that one might have to a property to, to stay there. And in the event that that right can be demonstrated, you will not get an order for eviction in, in the circumstances because they're a lawful occupier of the premises. But what the court has emphasized in this particular case is in circumstances where an occupant is found to be unlawful, um, then, then there's another inquiry that the court has to go into. And this is, this is part of the reason that um, a, a, an eviction in South Africa has to go through a court um, you'll know uh, if you if you listen to to some of our older our older podcasts. Um, you know the tribunal specifically can't order order an eviction of an unlawful occupier, um, and it's because there has to be some level of judicial oversight over all of the relevant factors um, in a case, so that the court can make the determination on what is just and equitable in the circumstances. All right, and and you know Pi specifically says all relevant circumstances so everything might be relevant to this particular inquiry um, it does set out some specific elements which should be addressed but really the court's going to look at everything in the circumstances um, now what what is interesting about this this constitutional court case is that the factors that were at play in this particular case were very extreme um, the the occupier in question 
had lived on the premises since she was 11 years old. It had, she was at the time of, of the, the hearing in her 80s. So she had lived on the property for 70 plus years. Okay. Um, so it's a very extreme uh, circumstance. Um, and obviously the, the court had to, as you say, do a balancing act between the owner of the property and the, and the particular tenants in the circumstances and what their rights were. But, uh, you know, what I, what I did take from the case and what I did think was important um, was the court applied the judgments which it had already set out when it comes to, to eviction. So there was a, a groundbreaking case, which is the Blue Moonlight Properties case, uh, you know, many years ago. Um, and in terms of the Blue Moonlight Properties case, there, the Constitutional Court also had held that an owner cannot be expected to provide free accommodation for a tenant indefinitely. All right. So, and, and in this case, they, they once again reiterate the position. And it's part of the reason that the, the court had sort of gone and said, well, you know, the SCA didn't see this right because the effect of the SCA judgment was that the tenants could indefinitely reside on the premises. Um, again, the court, the court sits and says, well, we've got to balance this. You can't, you can't expect a, a private landowner to just to, to forego their property for the rest of, of another person's life or for an indefinite period. Um, and so, you know, from, from my interpretation of the particular case, look, uh, the, the question of what is just and equitable in the circumstances, as I've said, that depends on all of the relevant factors of a particular case. And so the court has very particularly, or, or legislation at least, has very particularly left that open-ended. Okay, they've left it open ended because depending on your particular case, I mean, you could have any number of relevant circumstances, you know, no two cases alike when it comes to eviction applications, you know, and as much as the process might be the same, the facts behind those processes change, uh, you know, constantly. And it's important for, you know, for attorneys to keep abreast of, well, what is actually at play in this particular, in this particular case, so that you've, you've brought the right thing before the court and the court is kept abreast of all of the relevant information to make an order. Um, but I did think that that the interpretation of the Constitutional Court in, in this particular case was great, because they again confirmed the position that, um, you know, that an indefinite period is, is not acceptable for a private landowner to carry an unlawful, unlawful occupier. So to your question, you know, do I think that, uh, that it might lead to, to judgments that, that where the court goes, well, you know, you can't evict them from the premises. I, I would hope not. Um, you know, it, it does seem to me that the Constitutional Court in, in this particular case is confirming the position that uh, that was already set out in Blue Moonlight to say, well, you can't just expect to keep a property forever, uh, you know, in, you know, and, and just hold a, a keep a tenant for forever. Um, but the court then again goes into the inquiry of, but you have to find out what is just and equitable in the circumstances. And you know, for in this particular case, I mean, the, the eviction was eventually granted that the court took into account a number of factors, including the fact that the litigation proceedings um, took took some 14 years to get through from institution all the way to the end, um, as, as well as a number of other factors. You know, in, in this particular case, the, the landowner had tendered um, alternative property to the tenants. And I think it's very important that we mention again, the very last remark of the court um, when it came to the alternative accommodation, they say specifically that it didn't create a precedent that the private landowner has an obligation to provide alternative accommodation in the circumstances. It happened to happen in this case. It was tendered and it was still at the time of the constitutional court hearing tendered by the, uh, the particular landowner. But, but the court goes on and says, this isn't a precedent for that in the circumstances. It is a factor which must be considered. Sure. Um, so, so my personal interpretation, uh, I, I don't think you, you would hope that uh, you know Blue Moonlight Property, which is now being confirmed again in this in this particular case, you know you can't have a tenant just occupying a premises indefinitely. Um, there's got to be some balancing, uh, and the court specifically in this mentioned, you know, you can't overbalance the rights of an unlawful occupier in the circumstances, you have to weigh that up against the, the rights sure. of the particular owner. Um, so we would hope, we'd hope that we don't get an interpretation off the back of this, that, um, that yeah. it definitely is allowed. 
but uh, as, as the court says, you know, specifically in this in this case and, and the Blue Moonlight case, landlords might be expected to be patient. Depending on the circumstances, you might have to be a little bit patient. And that's a, that's an inquiry for the courts at the end of the day. What would be reasonable? Sure. No, that's great, Nick. And uh, I just wanted to add two things uh, just uh, just before we wrap up. So first thing, just for the viewers, we have uh, so this this part of the conversation relates to this case um, that is the uh, like Nick mentioned the, the the circumstances behind it were quite extreme. So you know we mustn't interpret this now as being a oh no, it's going to take me 14 years to do an eviction. That, that's, it's, two ends, it's two ends of extreme, right? We've had evictions in three weeks, which I've, I've not even three weeks, like three, four weeks in this special circumstances where the courts back in the day used to function in a completely different way. And we used to, and like I've had evictions take a number of years, right? The, the reality behind it is uh, between these extremes, there's certain odds that stack up to um, you know, the majority of the evictions taking place within a certain period of time, more often than not when it comes to tenant evictions. So uh, an eviction cannot take less than 14 days uh, because, uh, because of pie, as an example. And obviously through court process, it just keeps adding on, right? Um, you know, fastest eviction I think anyone's ever gotten is like six weeks, somewhere around there. And then you can actually get the guy out uh, through letters and just serving the notice. But then it goes up and you probably have a peak over here of three, in three months, you could probably get a tenant eviction. And then you start dealing with things like sales and execution and you start seeing that it takes a little bit longer. And, you know, then then the odds, um, then only the difficult cases remain. So people need to remember most cases, the three to six months, and then you start seeing like the harder cases. This was a very hard case because of like 70, the person lived there for 70 years. Uh, they were arguing that they had a right from a previous owner that couldn't be proven, et cetera, et cetera. So that's thing number one. Um, interesting thing number two, um, Nick was speaking about relevant circumstances. Um, and there was something very specific that the court said <laughs> that I find crucial because I've experienced this so many times. If uh, what's not relevant is the tenant's desire as opposed to the tenant's needs and being rendered homelessness, uh, uh, homeless. So a tenant that simply wants to live in an area because they want to maintain a certain uh, li lifestyle is very different from a tenant, uh, you know, the court having to consider whether they're going to be rendered homeless and whether their life is going to be turned upside down. And I've had cases like this where people were living in very lonely areas and they didn't want to move to an area that was more suitable to their budget because they like living in the, the security estates and stuff like that. And in this case, the court didn't think that this was a consideration that merited a lot of attention in her circumstances because she was going to move somewhere that was very similar. And her desire to stay in that specific house, you know, really carried no merit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Awesome. But thanks so much, Nick. All this yeah. fun. Thanks. Yeah. Be good. Yeah. Probably see you again next week. I bet I am seeing you again next week. I've already been told. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. No awesome. Have a good one and yeah, chat soon. Andres. Thanks, Bruno. Cheers. Cheers.